On this episode of Bootstrappers, we're going to speak with Pete Newbig about his sale of Empire Industries. We're going to talk to him about what it takes to sell your company. Welcome to Bootstrappers, a unique program designed to help make your business better. From property management to remote workers, Bootstrappers is here to help your business succeed. Bootstrappers is a production of Anaquim LLC. So let's lace up those business boots and join Bootstrappers with Jeremy and Gwen Aspen. Welcome to this episode of Bootstrappers. I'm your host, Gwen Aspen. And on Bootstrappers, we talk about topics that are important to real estate and property management entrepreneurs. On today's episode, I'm super excited to have Pete Newbig here. Pete Newbig uh, was one of the founders of Empire LLC, and he's going to talk about uh, how he was able to build Empire to sell. Really exciting topic. Just a reminder, Bootstrappers is powered by Anaquim. Anaquim helps property management companies be more profitable with its virtual assistant, back office support, and 24-hour call center services. Additionally, if you love the Bootstrapper show, please like, subscribe, tell all your friends, and leave us a nice little note on YouTube in the description. Or on our Instagram page, Bootstrapper Show, you can leave us a little note in the bio. Uh, the best note gets the book giveaway of the week. At the end of the show, we'll reveal what that book is. With that, I'd like to introduce Pete Newbig. Hi. Hey, Gwen. Thanks for having me. Welcome to the show. I'm super excited to be here. So it's really interesting because only 20 to 30% of small businesses ever sell. And you built one of those businesses. You told me that stat, and I couldn't. I just couldn't believe it. Yeah, I, I know the stat of where most most businesses fail, right? What is it? Ninety percent of all new businesses fail. Mm -hmm. uh, the first, what is it? The first five years, and then a percentage of those after five years fail. But I didn't know that it was such a small number of uh, of selling. Such a small number, and so a lot of businesses, you know, you get to a place in your life, and you're like what's the end game for this business, you know? And uh, selling it would uh, be an awesome end game for a lot of people, but getting there isn't always an easy route. So I thought maybe you could tell us about the genesis of Empire and then how you ended up building it in a way that you had investors come to you and want to buy it. Yeah, sure. So, you know, when we started Empire, we never envisioned selling. That was not the goal. Our, our big goal was if we can get to if we can get to a hundred doors, was our big goal when we first started. So, and uh, what year was this? This was in 2011. We started we started Empire unofficially in 2011, and in 2012, December 1, 2012, I had quit my full time job as an IT uh, manager, and became the CEO of Empire Industries full time. So that's when I took my, my business. And from, how many doors did you have where you ended up saying, okay, quit it, quitting the, the regular paycheck? We were only at 67 doors when I did it. Awesome. So it was, we had a business coach. So I hired a business coach even before we had the actual business, like running on its own. And uh, from, I learned from him, like, okay, I need to go ahead and do this. So interesting enough, I'm, I'm working full time. And uh, Empire is taking more and more of my time. So all of a sudden my weekends are gone, my nights are gone because Empire was taking more, I needed more effort. Then all of a sudden I'm working lunchtime at Empire. Now I'm stealing some time from my company and I said, this doesn't sit right. So I went to my company and actually went, start, I worked part time for a little while. Mm. So for about 10 months I worked part time. So I told them at the end of the year I'm leaving. So I burned the bridge knowing I'm gonna leave. So I didn't do it right away. So I was really, hesitant and scared. Quite of honestly. course, everybody to make that leap is a huge leap of faith. Yeah. And not everybody in your life believes in you. Did you have some detractors who were like, I don't know, Pete, I, are you I really going to do this? I was very fortunate. I did not have any detractors. My wife was 100% behind me, which if, you're, if your partnership is not all in sync, then you can't do it. You, you can't, can't move forward. And, uh, you know, my, my parents, everybody was just like, I had a buddy of mine said, why, why are you waiting? Like, let's just do it. But uh, again, I probably waited too long, honestly. But I don't recommend, like, if you have an idea, but you're not making any money yet, don't quit your job and then start the process. So, like, it's, it's tough because you're working two time, two jobs. It is tough. Start the process, get, you know, build the infrastructure, 
get some um, proof of concept yes, first. Get the proof of concept <laughs> and then go ahead. So when I left, I was making you know I was making over six figures at my IT job, and uh, Empire could pay me one thousand dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <clears throat> luckily, my wife worked. Our house was paid for. Our car was paid for. I did everything to set myself up for this moment. I didn't know when I was paying my house and my car off that this was going to be the moment. This was the time. But I set myself up, so I didn't have a lot of stress mm -hmm. when I went to Empire. Um, of course, I was a, I was a licensed realtor at the time, so I slung real estate on the side, and I made just as much money as I was making at my job the first year when I was part time. So, and you started with a partnership, correct? Or did you start it on your own? I did. No, I started with a partnership. Um, my, my famous partner, uh, some, a lot of people know that I probably listen to Steve Rosenberg. Yeah. Go to steverosenberg.com. He was the face of our franchise, so to speak. But Steve and I met uh, through an investor group. Out of those 67 properties, Steve and I owned 31 together. Okay. So before we started Empire, we, uh, we, we got to know each other really well by buying a lot of low-income properties. And, uh, and then we realized that, man, these are hard to manage. Let's, let's build infrastructure. We didn't, know, we didn't know anything about the industry. We had no idea that there was a property management industry, and we knew nothing about NARPA, the National Association of Residential Property Managers. We just did it. Like, we just thought we were like just solving our problem. We didn't mm -hmm. know that other people had these problems. Mm -hmm. And then people at the investment group said, hey, can you solve my problem? So we did. So then we doubled up in like a year. We went from like 30 doors to 67 doors. And I quit my job. And I owned a 52-unit apartment complex. Class D, real low-income stuff. Like we were the low-income guys. We didn't know any better back then. The first, day, the first day I'm going to my job, my new job at Empire, I get a phone call from my property manager on the, on, for, the, uh, for the apartment complex. They broke into our new office and they stole all of our computers and our safe. Oh my God. That was my first day at Empire. <laughs> <laughs> so if I didn't get to turn that, I should have just said, you know what I'm gonna do, you turn, go back to go yeah, back trial to my own, by fire. I'm gonna go back to my old company. No, no cushy IT company <laughs> anymore. It. No, you're no, the real deal I was, in, I was in the weeds. So uh, within a month, I hired a property manager, a girl that I met through NARPM. So, so by the time I quit my job, I had learned about NARPM. I said, holy cow, there's people here that actually know how to do this stuff? I didn't know how to manage properties. I was managing my, my own properties for 15 years, 20 years, but I didn't know what I was doing. She comes in. First day, she says, we have to fire half of your clients. And she goes, I would fire you as well. <laughs> But where I understand you have, we have to run your properties, but you need to sell them. What, why did she say that? Because she didn't want to do Class D? No, she didn't want to do Class D. No one was paying online. I mean, every problem that you can imagine, we had. In spades, but we didn't even know any better. So we didn't know. But she knew what it could look like. So uh, her name was Lisa, and I have to give her credit because Empire really got a facelift when we hired her. And Steve and I were smart enough to get out of her way, and we did it, though. We fired half our clients, and we changed our marketing up. Whoa, whoa, so you went from how many? I went back down to about 40 doors. <laughs> See, that's the craziest thing, but if you want to build, sometimes you do have to get rid of those properties, but that's a very scary moment to say. It, it's like quitting again, right? It's like we I know. Yeah. So, so you did, though. But you yeah. followed Lisa's lead, and she said to yeah. do that, and you did it. We did it. Just to give you an idea, our average rent, and we were in Houston, Texas, our average rent for our portfolio was about $800. It's like a smidge under $800. Mm. Uh, and our eviction rate was about 30%. No way. It's just, it was just a sandbox we were playing in. So Lisa comes in and she goes, you know, people will spend $1,500 to lease a property. I, mentally, I just never thought, I'm like, why would they do that? You could buy a house for $1,500. Like, my mortgage was less than that. And she goes, they do it all day long. And then she proved me wrong. She ended up bringing in doors that were- Did you get a were, software at this point? We did. We, we, I think that's one thing we did that was smart. We had a software called DIY Res, which was really like for like self-managers, yeah. zero to 20 doors. And we quickly moved everything over to Propertyware. So we looked at Propertyware, we looked at Folio. We moved to Propertyware at the time. You gotta remember this is, what's, uh, this is about six, seven years ago because uh, two things. One, we like the reporting a little better, but we like the fact that you can build your own fields. Mm -hmm. So we were property wear. And uh, yeah, so we were doing that. So Lisa started uh, showing me like this could happen. But early on, our marketing stunk. It was terrible. 
We were the fifty dollar a, 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 a fifty dollar a month guys. We started real low income. We were we were not selling our services right, and we had an image problem early on because we were just getting. Uh, you know, slumlords. So you were associated with the low-end products. Correct. Plus, we were offsing out of my apartment complex that was low-end. So the next thing Steve and I decided was we're going to move. It was free rent because I owned the apartment complex. We moved out of that property into a Class A building in Houston. This is before the pandemic and before everybody was virtual or, or online. And uh, we got a little... Uh, 900 or 1,000 square foot uh, property, and it cost us like, I don't know, like 3,000 a month. And we thought, oh my God, like we're never, like how are we gonna afford this? One thing, Glenn, that I found, and maybe you found this in your business, is every time you take that leap of faith and you invest some money back into the business, somehow the business absorbs it and you end up becoming more profitable. Well, and also with those office spaces, I mean, uh, Wistar Group went through so many different iterations of office space and moving up the ladder, but you can't get really high-end workers to work in some crappy office space where we there are used, holes in the doors and the, we the carpet is curling up. We wouldn't show them the office. I would interview <laughs> people at Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they don't want to work there. So if Correct. you want to increase your, um, your business and improve the types of properties that that you handle yep. and you need the people to do it that will associate well with those people, you have to have a higher end office space, I think. I'll never forget, um, for one, my business coach told me like environment matters. It does. Second, we had a like an opening, like we did this grand opening for a little uh, 900 square foot office, but my attorney came. My attorney sits down and he sits next to me and goes, this office is gonna make you a lot of money. Really, yep. what an interesting comment. And I said, well, why? He goes, because you're in a basically classic, because of the environment basically was what it was. And he was right. Because we went from the $50 flat fee a month guy to the 10%. We went to, we went from, we did the complete mm. opposite. And our, our website look changed. The, our, our, the people we hired changed. Right. And that's when Empire first took their like first jolt of growth. Mm -hmm. We were able to grow, and uh, that was uh, that was like a year. That was in thirteen. So it was and like did you feel later. differently about yourself? Also, hundred percent. Like 100%. you stand up taller when you know you're going into a good office space, and you hold yourself differently. It makes a huge you, you difference. Attract, you attract better clients. Mm -hmm. uh, you attract better talent. Mm -hmm. Just like you were saying, no one wants to go work in a class D. You know, apartment complex where you know. Where you have to ask walls. someone to walk you to your car at night. <laughs> True statement. <laughs> so, so we made a big change. So then our 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 focus changed, and our goal was if we just get to 300 properties, because we heard at a NARPM event if you get to 300 properties, then you become profitable. At 100 properties, now we had the office space. Mm -hmm. We had some higher paid, t higher talent. We were paying people a little bit more. We were starting to invest in some systems. And so we continuously invested in the business. I was still getting my big $1,000 check uh, <laughs> every month, Gwen. I was still making $1,000 <laughs> every month. And I would make some money on the leasing. And, and sure. I, would, I was just, I was just whatever I had to do to, to, to put food on the table, you know? But, uh, but interesting, so a couple years later, we get to 300 properties. And they were like, okay, we just get to a thousand. So did you get profitable at three hundred? We properties? did not. We did not. And and the main reason is we, we it's the way we ran the business. The business could have supported profit, but um, we were growth minded. And so you have to understand if you're a business owner listening to this, if you want to grow your business, you're gonna to have to invest in that business. And that means you're gonna to have to have delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. right? I made more money. Once I got to a thousand doors and I was super profitable, I made more money than I ever would have made at 300 doors. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. And I don't think anybody would have came knocking on the door to buy a 300 door company as much as a thousand door company. So how long did it take you to go from 67 doors to a thousand? Uh, we got to, I think it took us about six years. So it wasn't like this overnight success. Uh, Although that's pretty quick. I mean, yeah, overall, you guys were kind of, I remember you back in the day, you guys were animals trying to get your systems in order. And So we were very fortunate. Steve is the, um, my business partner Steve, is the quintessential visionary. And I'm the quintessential integrator slash operator. I, this stuff right here, I'm, I'm used to it now, but if, if we were business partners, this Steve would be sitting in the seat talking to you, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't have to fill any any time. You just <laughs> keep going. Uh, but 
for me, I love systems. Like I just I drawing flow charts. Well, you come from your IT background. Exactly. And and uh, I'm in a disc profile. Like I'm a CD. If, if you know if you if you know anything mm-hmm. about disc, if you're listening, uh, and Steve is like an I to the to the nth degree off the charts. So we. We didn't sit down at first and say, what do you want to do? What are you going to do? We just started doing stuff. And we um, just kind of, you know, just kind of gravitated. gravitated towards, like, I gravitated towards ops. He gravitated towards marketing and sales. And by the way, so that creates a big uh, friction at times in the, uh, in the partnership. But if you keep everything on board and we yell at each other in the boardroom and then we go have a drink after, like, we always kept our friendship above the partnership, even when we sold. Because there was some trying times. With, with sure. Uh, but but Steve, he was really the main driver behind the Empire name. He was big on branding. I'm like, dude, we're not Coca-Cola. But he, he just had this vision of what Empire is going to look like. Do you think that that impacted ha- the sale as well? I, I do. I really do. I think that people started to know us in the industry by what we were doing on the marketing side and the sales side. And then... They actually, took, when they took a look on, under the under the hood, so to speak, they saw what we were doing on the operational side, and so we were actually getting accolades from the industry on both sides of, of what we're doing. But what we would do early on, we'd go to a NARPM event in the beginning of the year. We, I'd write down all the things I wanted to accomplish um, until the NARPM event in October. So I'd go to the one mm. in April, and I would get as much done as I could. And then in and October, and you stuck to you stuck to that list. You were very disciplined about it. Well, some stuff got got crossed off. Some some stuff was, you know, I mean, you, you reevaluate, but, uh, sure. but what I did is on the plane home, I, 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 um, I would take it and I would prioritize everything. And that's when I would get rid of some stuff, maybe in the moment, you know, but it might even be like, read this book, read that book. But a lot of it was, obviously for me, it was system based, right? Hey, we need to go ahead and build this process for this. This is, oh, I got this great lease renewal idea. And so we would implement that. And you were big on training, too. Didn't you have a database full of videos that you trained your people with? But we did a database of videos for marketing and for training our team. Yeah. And that was huge for your team understanding how to do those operations. Like, it wasn't just that you wrote down your processes. You uh, also had the training well, kind of... Can I, can I plug Anaquim yeah. here? <laughs> so, sure. So... We had, we had that growth of 300. And as you know, as a business owner in property management, you, your, business, your, your systems break around 300, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we, we struggled along to about 400 doors. And then I said, man, what's happening is I keep getting more doors, more income, more revenue. But man, I got to hire these people and I, I cannot, I, I'm, just, I'm just not separating. All I'm doing is keeping up with the revenue. Right, right. Because every time you started making money, then if you got another U.S. employee, all those profits went to that salary and you can't get ahead. Right. And so the only way you can be profitable in property management is literally having your team be stressed. And that's just not a good environment that anybody wants to be in. And so, then you have high turnover. Exactly. And then you have training. Yeah. So what, I, what we did is we found you. We hired... I think three VAs at first. So we restructured our whole, after that, about a year later, we realized that we had gold, we found gold. So like, we found that we found better qualified people in Mexico, bilingual, college educated, that they were making good money for where they were living, Yeah. but it was two to one or two and a half to one. So for every uh, two and a half people in Mexico I could hire, it was one person in the U.S. And that one person in the U.S. had a GED or a high school diploma, no college, and uh, they couldn't read or write at a high level. Right. And, and the and dependability of those people is far less. Those people oh, in Mexico, they show up oh, to work. Like, they're work. dependable. Yep. And so uh, when we did that, we were able to build, grow the business again. But it comes down to training. So, you have, so this is a long-winded answer of, of what we did for training. So yeah, we have some videos, whatever. But honestly, I, I took those folks over Zoom calls and I trained with them. Like for, so for example, my maintenance team, two to three hours a day, every day for 90 days. You did? I did. I, I, and I had them, we would build a manual, a policy manual and a process manual. And they would build it while we were, while we were. Okay. So you didn't have, when you hired these folks and you're at 300 doors, your processes and procedures were broken. Broke. Okay. Broken. So you utilize those folks to help you create the manual so that your processes worked. And then you created a whole, 
all all the processes and procedures for for maintenance in 90 days because you were so intent on it. I wouldn't say all of them, but for for ma yeah for maintenance yes we did the, the turn process we did only maintenance not the turn at that time. Just, you, you start di diving into maintenance, there's a lot more than just answering a call oh, and schedule. Oh, for sure. Right? And so, well, here's the cool thing. So I taught the first three people. And so because they were helping me build that manual, after I taught them, when I hired new people, guess who taught them? Th they did. They did. So those 90 days, that effort you put forth, you said two to three hours a day, that was probably the most valuable time that you could have spent ever in the business. Would you agree? to build it because then it created this ripple effect. Correct. Absolutely. So I think people struggle with the process because processes and procedures are not easy. It's not easy. But if you focus on it, and you had other things to do, I'm sure there were other things you could have done during those did. two to three hours. We all did. The maintenance team still had to work, right? I'm taking them away from their day job two to three hours. So we would, we would, I'd pay overtime all the time. Didn't care. But, you're, but that was what it took for you to get to that next level. And then ultimately, that effort probably paid off in you being noticed and then getting bought out. Well, here's the other thing. It's not just that, um, that we have people that get trained now, but now... My es I have less escalations because they know how to handle everything. Mm. So now the, now the property managers are less stressed. Now the business is less chaotic. All so that investment, even though it was hard, even though it was scary, was just had such a big effect on the business. And that, I mean, that one investment led to everything else. Correct. People don't really realize that. They, they will put off the processes and procedures for 18 months Whereas if they just bite the bullet and do the main ones in, th in three months, yeah. it can change so, the trajectory. So once we got kind of stabilized, Steve comes to me and he's the visionary. So now he wants to build a company that can go across the country. So he wants to build what, what ended up, we ended up selling to a company that is doing this very successfully in mind. And we'll talk about that. But that's what he wanted. So we brought on a third partner, a guy named Brad Sugars. He owns Action Coach International, so he owns the franchise. Once we brought him in, so was the reason. What was the reason behind bringing in another partner? We felt that we have taken the business as far as we could go. That we wanted to bring in this guy who is a billionaire and he created franchises across the world, where he can lead us to going and building. A, a, a national property manager. So did did you think at that moment, and I know the plan changed, that you were going to create a franchise model for Empire? Was that the goal? We had talked about that. The goal ended up being we wanted to create a management company and own everything. Got we didn't it. want a franchise. Okay. And, and just lots of different reasons, but that was the route that we were going to take. Got it. And so um, once that happened, um, S Steve kind of had this, you know, I think he started looking at things a little bit differently. I did not. I still, I'm like, I got to still fix processes, procedures. We ended up, but with that, once we, once we parted with that, with that, with Brad, uh, Sugars, we then um, went to Dallas and Fort Worth. So we, we actually expanded our markets. Did it completely wrong, by the way. So if you're looking at expanding <laughs> markets, come see me. I'll help you out. Spent way too much money. And again, the business wasn't making any money now because we're investing all this time and, and effort and marketing dollars and people into something that I'm like, this is not sustainable. And so to be honest with you, Gwen, it was never my vision to, to go and build a company. And Steve and I talked about this. My vision would have been if I just had 1,200 properties in Houston. So I'm a smaller thinker than Steve. And so I don't know if I ever would have my company got, gotten sold if it wasn't for Steve. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Like, it kind of took both of you. And I guess the takeaway for people listening is if you have a partner, make sure that you have different skill sets so that you can build from each each correct. other. And make sure you have the same vision. The same vision. So you you did have different visions. At, at, some, at some point, we had the same vision going in because we were both so small-minded. But once we got to a certain point, he had a much grander vision. Sure. And I, I think had. that happens with a lot of partnerships where the ambitions are different um, at any point. So, so yeah, that's, that's a common issue with partners. So at any rate, so his vision changes right. and then what happens? So then in, uh, I think it was about 2018, he starts sniffing around like, Hey, um, I think this guy, you know, he, he, he buys a lot of, you know, so he's getting into like, Hey, let's buy management companies. Right. But meanwhile, I'm looking at our books. 
I can't even get a loan for like a car through Empire right now because again, we're investing so much in Dallas, Fort Worth, in our team, uh, like going, you know, just in marketing that we were up against it. We were breaking even or actually losing money. And so he's like, I want to go buy this company in Dallas. I'm like, I'm like, I want you to come to the bank with me. We go to the bank and they laugh at us because our balance sheet is negative. And he wants to get like a, you know, a $2 million loan. And I think that's when he realized he, we're in over our heads of trying to grow this thing mm. where we want to grow. Okay, so that makes sense. Also in 18, if you, if you think about it, the landscape of property management started changing where some of the venture cap money was coming Absolutely. in. Absolutely. And people were starting to sniff around. And so we talked, we, we, he, he asked me to come, I talked to one company and uh, I just saw how much work it was going to be. And I really didn't want to, I didn't want to join forces and, and do all the You work. mean to buy this other company? I'm or? sorry, no. Company, company sniffed around. They wanted to talk to us to about you. buying us. Okay. And okay. I had not thought about selling my business, but Steve wanted to talk to him. And we did. And it was more going to be like a merger type thing. But I don't know. Do you ever see somebody get merged? Do you know how hard that work is to get integrated into another company? I have seen, I've heard the horror stories. Yeah, so I just saw the writing on the wall, and I saw a bunch of visionaries at the boardroom table and one integrator. Was the integrator you? You know it. <laughs> <laughs> so who do you well, think is doing all the work? <laughs> right, no, and, and it makes sense. The person, and this is always the, the, the problem between sales and operations, are always have conflict, because the operation, sales sees dollar signs and pretty shiny objects and operations is like, yeah, but I have to get the day to day work. I have to keep my people happy and keep the clients happy. And I just don't see the vision. So it's the common, um, hundred percent. Right. I mean, it's not just the type of property, but the type of owner, but now it's like, Hey, I want to go ahead and do small apartment complex. I'm like, we've never done a small apartment complex. And so it was getting like that to, Hey, I want to talk to these people about them buying our business and I'm like wait what when when did that happen we're not in that game let's just, let's, let's just talk to him so we talked to this one company and um, it, it didn't work out for me Steve would Steve would have sold uh, I, so I can tell Steve and I had to have some serious conversations and they were not easy ones but you did it you we, had we had hard. to have the conversation and so at the end of the day Steve wanted to go on to bigger and better things and he didn't feel Empire's part out he wanted to go ahead and merge Empire with another company, and then he can be part of that C-suite of that company and be part of bigger and better things. And so he's like, hey, we can, we can, we can change the industry. We can influence the industry. We just need the right partner, and when they, when they bring us on board, we'll be influencers in, the, in, in there. And so, again, not my dream, but Steve and I had 20 years of partnership, and, you know, it, it did sound pretty good, right? We're going to get a bunch of money. We're going to be we're going to be these influencers. We're going to we're going to go public. Like it's a dream. it's it's like a, a chance of a lifetime if you think sure. about it, right? So, uh, because of Steve and his relationships and 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 our name out there in the industry, we we had a couple other suitors. If you so, you know. had several companies pursue to buy you. We we had two that we had meetings with. Wow. Yeah. But still. When 20 to 30% of small businesses sell and the re remainder just close, I mean, to have two suitors is yeah. really incredible. And it probably spoke to your operations, your training manuals, all the procedures that you bought. That wasn't, when people looked into it, it wasn't big hat, no cattle. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to think so, Gwen. <laughs> but when you get bought by another company, they also have their systems and their training and all, all of your systems and training goes away. Mm. So that, I think what they looked at, honestly, if I had to be truly honest, was just the number of doors that we had. Got it. And the amount of revenue we had. They didn't even care about profit. So this was interesting because um, as we're going through the, the as we're going through the sale, <clears throat> excuse me, I realized like it doesn't matter what my EBITDA is. It doesn't matter what my profit is because they have a certain way they're going to run the business. They looked at revenue. That was it. They didn't like. They didn't try to. So I got purchased at X, at X revenue. I'll, I'll be. I'll be open. I got. I got sold about 1.72 X revenue. They included my brokerage revenue, which I thought was really nice of them, and it was a very fair deal. It, 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 you know, could I have done a little bit better? Maybe, but um, it, mine was. I, I. I felt after I did my homework that mine was the industry leader in getting us to where we wanted to go, which was national. 
they also had a software and they already had establishment. So they software was built, they had they had the C suite, they, they had like they, they had everything. We were just gonna plug in and then they offered us roles inside the company where we'd be on the management team, which means that we can influence change inside the company. So it had all the all the whistles and bells that we were looking for. It, it checked all the boxes, so to speak. So if I could do it all again, I would have uh, focused, if I was going to build my company to sell and knowing what they're looking for, I would have focused more on, um, more on getting more clients. Like, like getting that revenue up. Getting the revenue up, right? So that's two ways, right? More doors. Mm-hmm. And then also, can I, how much can I get out of that door? Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. So profit per door. And more doors. I would say, I would actually just revenue per door. Okay, revenue. Right, oh, right, right. You said they didn't care about right, pro- okay, revenue, revenue per, per door. door. Yep, and, and more doors. So I would have, I was pretty stringent near the end of what we would take. I would have opened that up just a little bit, right? Just to make, but I don't want to, I don't want to open it up like floodgates and I have a bunch of churn. That does nobody any good. Right. And you're going to have to run this for a year now. So it's not like, oh, I'm just going to get a bunch of doors and I'm going to sell next month. It doesn't work that way because they're looking at your previous years. Right, so they're looking at your year to date when they're buying you, and they're looking at previous year, and they're gonna they're gonna kind of take the average. They're gonna average out the year they're buying you with last year and with what you're doing this year. So you can't just go get a hundred doors extra that you'd never would manage, and then uh, and then say, hey, well, this is gonna be extra revenue. So th- don't worry. So you do have to have good systems because you have to keep the doors and have a history of success. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so that's the name of the game, and then networking and building a brand, a recognizable brand that people want to be associated with, is the other piece of that you all had. Yeah, and I think also um, they wanted to buy Empire, but they also wanted to buy Pete and Steve. They wanted Pete and Steve. So, the more um, the more knowledge you have in the industry, whether that industry, for in Steve's case, was sales and marketing and influence or in my case, property management and systems, the more valuable you are, and they want you part of the deal. Now, when we sold, it was a contract to uh, sell the business, and then we had employment contracts. And one was one that had not ha- did not predicate on the other. So my employment contract was separate, and my sale was separate. So when we sold, um, I'll give you some details if you, if you, you don't... You yeah. Details? Sure, okay. So we saw 1.7x of doing the revenue. So it was it was a good amount, um, but it was a three. It was originally a uh, three-year payout, and then a percentage of that was in stock. So 20% was going to be in stock. I could have taken anywhere from 10% to 30%, and uh, I think if it was Steve, would have taken 30%. But if it was me, I probably would have taken zero. I wanted the cash, but uh, we want we wanted to join and be part of the movement. So we took 20%. I thought that was for for my. Um, you, from my from my peace of mind, twenty percent was good. So we took twenty percent. Um, we the nego- sorry, the negotiation on the price was non negotiable. They have a formula. They know what they're going to pay, and that's it. Like this is what we're going to pay. Take it or leave it. So, but other things are negotiable. So I couldn't negotiate the price, but I can negotiate the terms. So we got it from a three year to a two year, and we got it from a two year clawback, which is uh, which is based based on your churn, to a one year. So I was able to get a little bit of that, and so we got uh, and we got 60% up front with the with so basically 40 cash, 40% of cash, 20% in stocks that were automatically vested, and then the next year we got 20% minus a churn, and we were able to negotiate the churn pretty favorably because, as you know, um, even in a normal like right now this right year now. in 2021, oh, yeah. I mean churn is happening due to sales. Absolutely. Right? When you integrate churn increases, right? Because they loved Empire, and now it's not Empire. And just because it's not Empire, even though I'm talking to the same property manager, I'm going somewhere else, right? And of course, when you integrate, you just, you mess things up. You you make mistakes. Sure. So people leave. New new systems, new So we were really worried about the churn. So we capped the churn. So on the sales price, I can only lose about 20% of the sales price of the payout. So it ended up being, we had a lot of churn, I ain't going to lie, um, and I think it reduced our sales price, I want to say around 6 to 8%. Mm. So that's the other thing. The full sales price they offer you is not what you're going to end up with because there will be churn and they're going to want to claw back. So if Got I could it. go back in time, um, I, I might consider taking less money up front, one day payday, and you're done. There is no two-year mm. or three-year payout. Something that you should really 
consider if you're looking at selling something that you really need to think about. That is such opinion. helpful advice. Yeah. So, uh, so then um, we get the sale. They, then I ran the business from October when we got the sale through February, just like it was Empire, except for I would just send the money to Mind Accounts and all that good stuff. And then on February, we did an integration. That's when we moved off of our PropertyWare software onto their internal software. They came down, trained all of the team, uh, moved to their Salesforce system off of our HubSpot. Um, and basically, we sold the contracts, not the business. So I was still stuck with the LLC. They didn't absorb that. Uh, and I say that kind of facetiously, but you have to remember, you, have, you still have to file taxes. You have to keep that business open until the next year when you can finally close the business. Mm. And it, it, all these realtors out there know that, if, especially property management, if somebody has a complaint against you um, and they sue you, you're still on the hook. So... They were able to, ah, yeah. So you got to be careful. So I closed the business as soon as I could. I, I got my uh, my real estate. I was the broker. I was the uh, the broker of record. So you have some cleaning up to do when they don't buy your your uh, your business. They buy the contracts. Got it. Yeah. So clean that up. We negotiated a nice contract. I am now the executive. Um, I want to say executive vice president. I think I'm the regional director, or regional vice president. Uh, I think the regional vice president is what I, is my official title in mind now. Nice. And so we sold October 19. Today we're in 2021, uh, and I got one more payout still coming to me. Doesn't predicate on churn because we we negotiated the one year, and uh, Steve ended up not it not being his cup of tea. So he is no longer an employee oh. by mind. He's got a contract, as of today, he's got a contract with them doing what he loves to do best, podcasts, videos. So he's kind of being an influencer for mine. And uh, today I manage 10 property managers wow. in 11 markets. And oh I think gosh. we're around 2,200 properties that I'm responsible for oh my with, gosh. with my team. And that's where we are today. Wow. Well, that's so exciting. We really appreciate you coming on, telling your story, because a lot of people want to sell and... Um, it's really good to hear from someone how it went, what the terms were, so that they can go into it with a little bit more knowledge. Yeah, I, like I said, we never, never, we, you know, you always, we've always been told by our business coach, always create your business to sell, um, and, and, but even if you don't want to sell, even if it's not there, always right. build it to sell. Uh, I was building a business not to sell. I was building a business because my definition of a business is a business, a, it's a profitable enterprise that runs without me and grows without me. And so that's what I was building for. I was actually exiting stage left. I was, for the first time in my career, I was only working about four hours a day. Oh, really? Yeah. After 80, 90 hour work weeks sure. for years, I was finally getting out. And so I'm like, oh, rat farts. Like, I was almost out, and now I'm, now I'm working 40 plus hours a week again. <laughs> but um, but you sold your business. You did something most companies can't do, and super successful. So good work, and kudos to you. Thank you. So with that, I think that's the perfect ending to bring up our book giveaway of the week. We have a, a wonderful, very apropos book, um, Built to Sell which is creating a business that can thrive without you. And it's by John War, 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 Wallowitz, I think. I, I, I think, yeah, I think you got it. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, thank you so much, Pete, for being on the show. I so appreciate chatting with you. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks for having me on. Really and that's a wrap. We'll see you next week on Bootstrappers. This has been Bootstrappers, a unique presentation designed to help you better understand how the world turns. Contact Gwen or Jeremy at posts at bootstrappers.club or visit our website, anaquim.net. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and our YouTube channel. Thank you and join us next time for Bootstrappers. <laughs>